Good evening and welcome to Nursing with Intention community webinars. I am your host, Dr. Patrice Little, founder of Nursing with Intention, as well as a family nurse practitioner. And I just wanted to briefly introduce um, what Nursing with Intention is and how it started. It is a health equity initiative that exists to improve the racial cultural competencies in nurses to reduce health disparities. As many of you may know, or you're living through right now, is uh, we just experienced a global reckoning that was activated by the recurrent deaths of Black men, George Floyd, um, Ahmaud Aubrey, as well as Breonna Taylor, and recently the uh, shooting of another unarmed man, um, Jacob Blake. So the reason why these webinars or we exist furthermore is to make sure that we continue as far as sustainability, the education of um, how racism impacts the health of the community and which we're seeing more is connected with what's going on as far as COVID. So that's what we are in a nutshell. And and um, I just wanted to welcome you once again and give you some uh, housekeeping rules that for tonight's webinar, we have a chat section and we've also allowed you to speak. You are, you're not on camera because we know that um, for sensitive topics like these such as such, that many people just want to remain anonymous um, as they reflect and we are grateful for that um, because that allows you time to grow uh, privately. So what we wanna make sure is that we're still respectful because some of the content that we'll be discussing will evoke some emotions and sometimes that happens. Sometimes things that are truth that we haven't um, acknowledged as a truth, it makes us feel uncomfortable. So we acknowledge that and just wanted to remind you that this platform serves for education um, and, and it's not here to um, actually pull anyone down um, and that's all that I have for you to say I mean you have as far as that part and now I wanted to just briefly talk about um, what will are the, the movie Selma so the reason why we chose this movie um, as far as the community discussion is we wanted to start off here because this is also the uh, time we're about 60 four days away from election. I believe I could be off by one, but um, so we're very coming close to uh, re-election. And one of the things that we just have to be mindful is that in the past four, uh, four years, there has been increase in division, an increase in, um, in violence. And it's so important that we have an appreciation of the history that has occurred because like my friend Jordan had mentioned earlier today when we spoke, it's almost like this is, or not almost, it is, like she said, this is the modern civil rights movement. So we're reliving this situation um, again because that um, we, many of us have not been educated properly. So um, the movie Selma, that has a lot to do with the, and we're grateful for it, just activating um, the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And it is a dramatization of Martin Luther King, as well as other civil rights leaders, such as John Lewis, the recent, um, the late John Lewis, who have demonstrated peaceful protests in order for us as uh, Black Americans to have the right to vote. And that has all of that, what they, um, they did, did what they demonstrated. They dealt with a lot of violence in order 
for us to, to pave the path for us to vote today. And it, once again, we're still dealing with the, the actual, um, the suppression of the votes um, for the minority community. And this impacts many things in the sense that um, when minorities are not able to vote or to use their voice as citizens, it, in, it impacts the opportunities that they have, which is connected to systemic racism. So um, before I move any further, I wanted to also introduce the speakers that we have today. I wanted to start off with um, Dr. Carol Bennett and Crystal Carothers. They are my right hand. Uh, these two nurses have been um, so inspirational and they have been the voice as well as the organizers behind this first community discussion. So they will be also participating in the dialogue uh, tonight. And then last but not least, I wanted to introduce Jordan Rice. She was the, and is it the third little girl or the fourth little girl? <laughs> <laughs> the third one, yeah. So she was the third one, um, little girl. Um, at the beginning of the movie, where the four of the four little girls, where the it was the Birmingham and Birmingham bombing at 16th Street Baptist Church, which activated the protests uh, that needed to be, and I say needed to be because it did need to be done. And, um, and joining Jordan is her mother, Dana Rice. And um, she has been an inspiration to me as, as well as to my family. So welcome Dana and Jordan. And just real brief, I wanted to just talk a little bit about Jordan. She's an actress from Atlanta, Georgia, whose mission is to bring social justice to the world. She's known for her work as the last girl on the stairs before the bombing in the four little girl scene of Ava DuVernay's Oscar nominated film Selma, the, D the DC Universe Doom Patrol, and Cartoon Network's Powderpuff Girls, I love Powderpuff Girls, at campaign. A lover of all things arts, Jordan views the world through her cre creative lens, even down to her food choices. She is the creator of Talking Jordans, a comedic sketch on YouTube where her characters move from the serious um, from the ser serious to the hilarious in 60 seconds or less. Her latest project is her podcast, Get Into It, where she and her co-creator discuss the struggles of being Black faces and white spaces. To see what she's doing next, follow Jordan on social media at actress Jordan Rice or use the girl you part of me use the hashtag that girl be acting. So welcome Jordan, I'm happy. And Jordan is a senior this year. So this is really exciting because she's actually uh, blossoming into a um, just well-versed activist and we're just grateful for that. So this is a time let's just segue in to talk about Selma. And um, we'll start off with the few questions that we have to um, guide us with the discussion. And you guys are feel free to just speak whenever you're ready. And we just start off with what was, um, what is the message of this movie? And do you agree or disagree with the message that was portrayed? So I want to make sure that I, uh, I unmute everyone. Okay. Anyone have any comments as far as the message with the movie? Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's the first thing I need to ask. Okay. I don't think anyone wants to be first. <laughs> no one wants to be first? Okay. Well, yeah. I guess I will. You guys can't have the whole speak the whole time. But yes. <laughs> so one of the things is um, I felt like there were so many messages in this movie. I don't know about you all, but I felt like there were many messages. They were just messages at, at the very be beginning of the movie. Um, 
one of the the messages that I noticed it was subliminally was the fact about that family unit with um, Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King and how that was his rock that was his go-to so that was one of the the messages that I pulled from there even though we know the main message was for was the outcome of being able to be citizens who can vote in in Selma um, because um, voting was allowed but in a sense they were not allowed to register to vote so there was a lot of messages in there that was one message the other message was i believe i'm trying to think that other lady's name at the very beginning anna lee cooper so there was one of the message that was at the beginning was that okay even when black um where when blacks had the opportunity to do things such as register to vote there was still this there this this barrier and it was like basically as almost like a silent agreement or a code where it still was not allowed so i don't know if you guys remember that part but he was he was he was she was saying it's all right it's all there and he said hey this is right when i say it's right now i want you to recite the preamble so she recites the preamble. So then he's like, well, how many um, counties are in Alabama? So she says 67 counties. Then he said, name them. And it's like, what? Like, that's not even a part of the criteria on the paper. So that was very, that was, there were so many messages. Did anyone else grab anything from that? I don't wanna hog all the talking. <laughs> Any other messages? Well, as you um, stated, there were many, many messages in there. Um, I kind of think it goes with um, what that individual person got out of it. I mean, I've seen, as far as the messages I've seen, I've seen a lot of struggle. There was a lot of struggle. And then, you know, looking at where our world is today, um, our abilities to vote, you know, however, um, everyone doesn't take it serious. Um, even when when you dress nice, you have the funds and that type of stuff, you're still being treated as a um, second class citizen. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like one of the biggest questions for me, just watching this and seeing all of, um, you know, the the barriers that they had to go to is like, okay, well, you know, how, how did we get here? You know, how did we get there? Mm -hmm. You know, but at the same time, we're still here, you yes. know what I mean? But at the end of the day, no matter what the situation was, it still was a fight that they was willing to make, um, you know, to make it possible for um, Black Americans to vote. Mm. And um, as you stated earlier, in regards to that family unit and stuff, you know, um, we know that it's important to keep the black family um, together, you know, the father, the mother, and the children. And you see how um, there was destruction going on within the family, but it was like, we'll keep that to the side. I'm aware, however, we need to stay together because mm -hmm. that's the only way we're gonna make it. And we see today that because we don't stay together, there is a um a lack of you know that strong family in us um going you know forward together if you understand what i mean by that mm -hmm. but um like you said it, it was a lot of messages and stuff but what i took out of it was just that struggle you know but regardless of the struggle um we're still going to make it we're still going to do it we're going to get beat down you know some of us are going to die you know but we're still going to push forward for the right to vote, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good segue as far as you mentioned to push forward. You mentioned to push forward for that right to vote. So was there anything particularly, and I kind of am leading, leading the question as far as leading the answer, that in that movie that happens that reminds you of what's going on today? Was there anything in the movie? that you all saw that reminds you of today? 
Well, the fact that she um, went with money, as I stated earlier, you know, you're, you're going presentable. You're not going where you're looking like, you know, there's going to be a problem or whatever. I have the money, but you still make it difficult for me. And today it's still difficult for, you know, um, the, the minority, whether it's Black American, uh, Mexican American, Asian American, whatever it may be. You know, like right now, it's like, okay, because of COVID-19 or the coronavirus, the mail, the mail-in votes, do we want to do that? Okay, if we do the mail-in votes, are they going to get to where they need to be? There's issues with the post office now, where things are being taken away from the post office, or post office is being um, closed down. You know, then it's like, okay, well, if we do in person, how are we going to um, accommodate the social distancing? You know, so, I mean, it, it's um, a lot of, um, oh, I can't even think, think of the word right now. So it's, it's a similarity right there. No okay. matter what the, um, the obstacles are, I'm going to try. However, someone is still going to keep throwing an opt obstacle um, right in front of you. You know, and I mean, this is a different world today. But we're still, you know, being held back from um, trying to make that vote, you know, to get the correct people into office. Thank you for sharing. Does anyone else like to, is there anyone else who'd like to add to that? Um, to the second question was, was there anything that happened in the movie that reminded you of something that has occurred in your life or something that you've observed in someone else's life? Um, yes. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, I think you're on mute, Dr. Bennett. Okay, let me see. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, you know, I just thought of Martin Luther King's, he was so brilliant in the way he dealt with um, uh, President Johnson. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was so strategic and he had so many people behind him. And it makes me think of Stacey Abrams and how brilliant she is and how she's mm -hmm. using that. Her understanding of the law is unbelievable. And every time I hear her talk, I learn so much. And um, she's really kind of turning the whole thing upside down. And she has a big following, not as much as, as Martin Luther King did, but it's growing. And um, I really appreciate what she's doing. It's in the state of Georgia, I know, but um, voting rights, trying to get those restored, and she's following it all over the country. And um, with gerrymandering and everything, I mean, it's gotten so vicious uh, to keep people from voting, especially large blocks of minorities. And she's really trying to, so it makes me think of her as being um, that brilliant strategic brain that might get us across. You know, so I do think about her and um, I'm just proud she's a woman, you know? <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. And thank you for sharing. And does, is there anyone else who likes to add to that? Well, let me just say one more thing about that. I was struck by, I did not realize that he postponed the march one day. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know about that. And he really was very um, respectful and didn't want to sacrifice people unnecessarily and knew that they were walking into a trap. And um, so I, I did not know that about him. I mean, I knew he was a brilliant man, very compassionate man, but he really put off his goal for a day to try to think and figure out what was the best way to save lives and so I, I had not known about that mm -hmm. previously. So um, anyway. Thank you for sharing. For me, it was, I believe the minister's last name was, it's Reeb. Um, he was the minister who came down the, was he, I believe it was a priest that came down from um, Boston 
Mm-hmm. And literally, it just made me think about what just happened on Monday. Um, with, I'm trying to remember his name. Someone please help me. The, the young man that um, was shot, who was an ally, and he was, was trying to, he was, it's the same thing in the sense that when you have a, a non-Blacks, um, well, this gentleman was Caucasian, um, wanting to help out. That was the thing that I admired the most about Dr. King, where he was really about engaging, just he was happy for, that all people were coming to support when they, when he summoned, he's like, look, ministers, come out. Um, and sometimes I feel like, I believe he's the one who says that Sunday is the most segregated um, day um, of the week because uh, there's, as far as churches, and when he, when, he's, when he made that call for ministers to come out and that young man came out and then for him to die so young and to be um, to killed for something that he was because he knew that it wasn't right. That that's the part that was um, that resonates with me um, as far as what still goes on today. Because we just saw that last week, Monday. Does anyone remember that young man's name? The um, I believe his name was Anthony Huber. Anthony Huber. So, um, if, if, does anyone else have anything to add? Were there any characters in the movie that made you angry or just emotional? I guess I got to that one um, a little earlier with, um, but yes, you had something to share? Oh, I thought, Dana, did you have something to share? I thought your hand was up. No, no but I, I, I can. Okay. <laughs> um, Characters. In this movie, there were a couple that they don't even speak, but their their presence and what they contributed was so profound. The one there was a a lady who was against the movement. Um, you see her when the marchers are are marching past. She has a coat and a um, a purse, and she has this look of disgust, like. Mm. And she never speaks. I don't know if anybody knows the lady that I'm referring to. Okay. She doesn't speak, she doesn't have a name, but um, she's standing on the sidelines, just, you know, the, these marchers are just disgusting her. In her face. And just in her facial expression, just showed so much hate and um, just really put you into what was the feeling in the air at that moment. Mm-hmm. So she really stood out. And um, the Viola Luizo character, the lady that had come down to help, um, she never speaks, but when she sees this um, news coverage and it just moves her to Mm -hmm. get involved, that was very profound. And I think that a lot of people today who are seeing, you know, these reports on TV and in social media are being moved in that way. and that's, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm. Thank you for sharing. That is correct. And that's one of the reasons why we, the team and I decided to have these discussions um, that are about, um, it raised the awareness of like, makes you more racially conscious um, as far as what goes on. And, and then from there, more responsible, socially responsible to play your role. And one of the things that I admire about D- Dr. King is that just the way he prioritizes, he prioritized things. He, it wasn't, I mean, yes, there's a million and one things that we all want. And that's the question, like, what are we fighting for? What, what is it that we want? And what's most important at this time? And quite frankly, he mentioned a lot that it was about the lives, about, okay, just to not be assaulted and intimidated, but to have that freedom just to live and have opportunities that have been granted by our constitution. And for us to still see that play out today, 
um, it's, it's actually, it's sad. And, and I don't want to say that his work was in vain. I would, I would never say that. I would like to say that he created a path and it's up to us to take interest into exploring more into the history for the younger um, generation and for those who may not uh, be aware much about um, um, Black history per se, which is American history, to, to learn more about it through films, because that's the best way. Storytelling has always been the best way. And for um, people who, are, who, are, um, who go to church, that's how stories have been told in the Bible. That's how you get it across. Uh, you touch people in their heart with the stories and that's what it was about. And you make it about the people. And that's why this exists because it's about the patients. Every, seeing all of this that goes on, it's not just mentally debilitating for black America, it's Americans in general. Seeing that play, see to see that then and to watch it again, um, that's a lot. And quite okay. frankly, I'm not saying this to be facetious, but I really feel like after all of this, we're all going to need some serious therapy. I, I'm heartened by the protest, how widespread it was. Yes. And people of all generations and races. It was not just in the South and it wasn't just black people. It was everybody Everyone. and everybody's tired of it. And I think that's heartening somewhat. I mean, hopefully it'll, it'll matter. And um, I mean, John Lewis talked about the progress that had been made. I think he felt like, you know, he, his life was lived um, as a legacy of Dr. King. And he did talk about that at the end of his life, you know. He did. Um, but the protest, all ages, um, all kinds of people, um, I, I think that's, that's quite a statement about what's in people's hearts now, that they're, they're tired of the, um, the terrible treatment. Mm -hmm. So everybody, well, there are a few who are not, you know, they're still a small group. Yeah. <laughs> but it's certainly much more widespread. I mean, when I saw those black people, I mean, excuse me, the white people on the sidewalks jeering and everything, it's just so shameful. And at least now, I think the majority of white people think that people should be treated equally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so. I, I was heartened by how many people came out and the kinds of people in the tiny cities. And um, so it's, the movement is definitely alive and growing, seems like to me. But God, I mean, how many people have to die? You know? We ask ourselves that every day. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm yeah. sure you do. Um. Yeah, how many? And so for our next question, it mentions about if you if you were basically Ava DuVernay or and you wrote this the 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 dramatization part because we know that even though it depicts a true story, there's still parts just to make it a, a good movie that um, is added. Would you have changed the ending of the the movie? I mean, it is history, but would, would, would you have had it go a different way? Jordan, you have something to say? Um, personally, I wouldn't have. Okay. Um, it's because, like you said, it is history. All of us know what happens. That's one of the few things of history they actually teach in school. And um, I think there was something powerful about being able to see this black man speaking to a wide group of people 
talking about what the nation needs to see to have what we set claimed in our foundations in the fabric of this country be true. I think there's something so powerful about that moment and to see that um, image. And for me, I was 11, 10 when we filmed it, 11 when I watched it. And even though I knew what was going to happen, there was something powerful to me just seeing a black man say stuff like this and talk about the equality amongst people. Mm -hmm. um, I think that really was an image for for us as the audience to become hopeful and to aspire to have what he was talking about be the nation that we live. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have changed it personally. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't change it either. I wouldn't. So can one of you pick a character um, and this is the question from that character, like if you were a psychologist and you were to look into the actions of that character, what do you think or what do you think a psychologist would say about his or her behavior? I know that is a pretty, pretty tough one. I'll simplify the question. Like, is there anyone whose behavior you felt like, man, they, they're just, they're, they were just off. <laughs> and you probably would recommend that, you know, that they're, they needed some type of help. Because one of the things with racism, um, and I'll preface it a bit, uh, is the fact that it's, it's been a part of a code for, for so long for um, white supremacy per se. And I use that word um, as a descriptor because I don't wanna say like whites in general, um, but uh, white supremacy. Um, they, to uphold it, there has to be some type of narrative that is sustained, that's created and that is sustained. And anything that goes against that narrative, like we mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, anytime you're challenged with the truth, that's all of us, including myself, that when you're not ready for it, you're, you're resistant, you get angry, you do things that are not rational. And there, that was illustrated several times throughout the So um, if I were to pick a character that I felt like, wow, he was really off. That was the sheriff. Um, that I believe it's the, sh the, sh the sheriff. And because I, I just felt like there was no need to become volatile when everyone was peaceful. And um, it was, his actions was, um, it demonstrated that he, there was no type of control and he didn't know how to control, but to be violent, even though they were the, <clears throat> the protesters, they were peaceful. So, I'll pick that one out. Okay, so the last one is, how can you apply the lessons from this movie to your own life? So how can you, there were many lessons, how we mentioned there were many messages and through those messages, there were lessons. How can you apply it to your life today? Um, as far as what can you do better? Or maybe you're doing great already, but you can enhance what you're doing when it comes to um, really just the unification of people, because that's what it boils down to. Hmm. I um, volunteered to be on a diversity committee at the University of uh, Georgia Southern University. I don't know if y'all are aware, but the, um, the, the atmosphere of exclusion there is really pretty severe. And last year, uh, the administration hired a group of consultants that came in to do an evaluation and they had an anonymous hotline and they had over 250 anonymous racist comments on that hotline. Mm. And um, it's pretty, I, that's the, my area of research is I teach in the College of Nursing there. And um, so I could be more active. I could speak up more. And, you know, 
it just has to be within the context. I, you know, I fear alienating people to, if I am too aggressive. So, but I did volunteer to be on that committee, which I think given that environment is going to be very challenging, but I'm a, well, we have your back. <laughs> yes. We need to make a lot of changes there. And, um, and I don't know the answers to how you do that, you know? Mm -hmm. No. But I'm de definitely willing to be part of the process. So anyway, that's, I need to be more active personally. Speak up. Are there any other participants who like to share? If you want, um, you do not have to speak. You can just type it in the chat. Well, I wanted to um, kind of, you know, agree with um, Dr. Bennett as far as being more active. Um, and honestly, um, being, you know, a part of nursing with intention is a way for me to, um, you know, commit to that where... Um, um, being intentional on educating those around me, whether it be nurses or patients themselves, as far as um, the differences and the likes of, um, you know, different people and, and health issues they may have and um, inequalities or disparities that may be going on and just trying to figure out um, how to fix those disparities. And I think more so that's through that education and stuff, um, you know, to educate the community, educate, um, you know, other nurses or fellow nurses on a regular basis and just pointing things out um, at that time, you know, not waiting, being um, intentional and saying, speaking up, you know, at that time and not waiting to, um, you know, feel like, is this the right time? It's always the right time to address um, something that may not be right. And that's, you know, in the way of caring for um, one person compared to the next person. We want to all be cared for equally. Yeah, so being more active, yeah, is a big part. And I think, you know, more so, um, like I said, for myself within um, our community as far as nursing and in my own, you know, community as far as a Black woman, you know, because, um, you know, some of our brothers and sisters, they're not, you know, educated on, you know, the realities of, you know, the true, you know, meanings behind some of the stuff that we've been through, you know, or even have a guide on how to um, move forward from that. I agree. So it sounds like that you were saying that they don't have much of appreciation for all of the, um, the work that mm -hmm. has been put in the path that was created. Uh, kind of like Dr. Bennett was referring to with John Lewis, where he was continuing the legacy of Dr. King. And quite frankly, it has been an end of that whole era of all of those civil rights leader that we, we are the ones that have to continue that no matter which way that we go about it, whether you are Jordan and you um, play um, a major character, which involves a lot of studying of that character, or you're Dr. Bennett and you're in, in a committee everyone has uh, a part to play and no part is insignificant. One of the things that I like to reinforce as we, um, as I close out this section and we go into our interview with Jordan is that um, particularly for nurses, for the reason why this platform exists because it's, it, we have to be cautious about going out there protests. Because there's a lot of risk that comes with one of the major risks is, of course, our livelihood, um, in the sense that anything like could 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 happen that that takes away, and it's and I'm kind of like fickled with that statement because 
that's what comes with taking a stand is to take that risk or you may lose a job, whether you protest or whether you just be vocal and call something out um, that, that occurs at work with the, with the patient, maltreatment towards a minority patient. So it's one of those things that uh, I really feel that if we start within our circle, within our community, you know how they say each one teach one mm -hmm. and we keep ourselves accountable and to, to be intentional, I really believe that we could make a change. We can, we can make a change um, with that. So that, that's where I would like to, to end for, for this part, just to reinforce how, it, how the story of Selma, how does that translate to what we see today in, in healthcare and for us to make a change in nursing? Number one, the racism is a public health issue. And why is that? Well, when you think of health, if you, and I talked about it in that live video on Friday for those who are on um, social media, well, health is defined as the absence of dis-ease and the discomfort and, um, and it involves the mental and the physical component. Um, and some definitions say spiritual as well. And because the whole goal of us having certain things in place by getting annual exams, and screenings and vaccines, all of that is to prolong our health so we do not die prematurely, which moves on to when there's violence and this type of stressors where black men fear for their life and black women fear that their black men will not return home, whether that be husband, son, um, or brother, that interferes, interrupts the stability of the ment of the mind. That is a mental stressor, which contributes to that physical stressor, and that's really what makes it truly part of that public health issue because it's it's a it's a group of people, and so we just have to be mindful about that in the sense that at the end of the day, when black men are dying prematurely because they are being executed on the street. That is a, once again, public health issue, dying prematurely the same way when it comes to, that's my timer for me to uh, talk with Jordan, but the same way when it comes to children not getting vaccinated with, um, with the flu vaccine and they die from complications of the flu. So that's what we just have to remember how it all ties into. And um, at this time, I just wanted us to uh, talk with Jordan, this Q&A about um, just how it was with creating the, being a part of this, um, this movie and what her thoughts are today moving forward. Uh, as someone who's socially responsible. So you mentioned earlier, Jordan, that um, at the time you filmed, you were 10, and when you watched it, you were 11. But can you tell us like how that process came about with you being selected for this movie? Yes, yeah, so um, before I filmed Selma, I was in a play about the four little girls where I played um, Denise McNair. She was one of the girls that died in the church bombing. And one of the actors that I was acting opposite of uh, had an audition for Selma. And she went in and I guess she didn't, like she showed them pictures of all of us working on the play. The play had nothing to do with the film. And wow. she was in the audition and showed them pictures and they're like, oh, who are these people, da da da. And so she told them about the play and that's how she learned a lot about the characters and stuff like that. And so, she convinced them to give all the girls that were involved an audition, which does not happen because <laughs> she's basically telling people to audition her competition, I guess. So they called, her mom called my mom and my mom had to be convinced to take me down to the audition because like, we've never done film or anything like this before. We don't know how it works. And then something convinced her to take me down to audition. Uh, we auditioned, in the time that I was auditioning, they had already been auditioning those roles for a few months. And so we were coming at the end of like where they thought they had their people. And we got in the room and we were talking to them about 
we did the audition and we talked to them about the research that we did for the characters and all that other stuff and it started a dialogue and we were cast in it. Me and the girl who told me about it were the only two from the play that got cast in the movie. So that was cool. Wow, I love that. So it seems like it was created for you. <laughs> <laughs> Because you were already doing it, you know, that, I mean, that's the perfect example of when preparation meets opportunity. So now that, okay, so like, what was, I want to say, like, how are you like Denise McNair? I understand that there is some studying that you usually do a bit about the character. Is there any similarities that were there as far as you and um, Denise? Um. Uh, with Denise and all the girls that were uh, that we were portraying, mm -hmm. it was just more of their dreams because they were very young. They were 10, 9, 11, one was 13. They were very young and they were looking towards what they wanted to do in their lives and the change and the impact that they were going to have within themselves. And so at that time, it was kind of the same thing. I was like, I have all these big aspirations and I want to do so many things. And just having that that vision at such a young age and then being able to dream. And despite all the trouble that is happening, the racism, you still being having that childlike ability to dream and then having that being taken away from you. Um, that's something that I related to her in the sense of dreaming and, and wanting so much out of my life. And then when, when you just, when that's ripped away from someone, mm -hmm. that really helped us play these characters a lot. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow. So we've mentioned earlier about how there's a lot of, as far as what happened in, of course, Birmingham and Selma, there's some similarities to what is occurring today. Can you tell us what stands out, like I guess the most to you today as far as the similarities of that, how that story is similar to what occurs today? Yes, there are two things that are really just like in my mind. One uh, is the relationship the police had with the protesters. Um, and I think my mom pointed this out to me like a couple of weeks ago and we were just talking about the protests that are happening, we've always been like, this looks like the 60s, like it looks like we're back in the 60s, like what is going on? Mm -hmm. And then it's like the same people who are aggressive and beating and gassing these peaceful protesters, it's the same thing that was happening on Bloody Sunday. It's the exact same thing. Of course, they're protesting the system and the government and the powers that be, but the aggressors, the people that are actually brutalizing, the people asking for change are the police. Um, and that really stuck out to me um, that in the 60s and today, we're, we're fighting the same fight with the same people. Yeah. Um, so that stuck out a lot to me. And then just now when my mom was, when you asked about the characters that stuck in your mind, you want to know the psychology of them. When she said the ladies that looked really disgusted at the protesters, it made me think of Oh, I forgot the city, but the couple that were pointing guns at the protesters walking by their houses. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just the rage and disgust and hate in their eyes for people who are just asking the world to see that they matter. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And it's so disheartening because there are movies like this that we're supposed to learn from and take from that are supposed to be a, uh, allow us to have the difficult conversations and really analyze who am I right now in this time? If I was back there, what side would I be on? And a lot of people are failing that test. A lot of people are getting it right, but a lot of people are failing that test. Those was dead to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I can't come behind that because I, mean, I know that was so powerful. I had to write it down. What side will I be on? So I guess I'll ask myself that too. You know, that's powerful. But I, I apologize, Dana, I interrupted you. No, I was just probably piggyback on what she said. It's so true. And just sitting here listening to my daughter tell me these things or tell us these things. Um, 
and even though I'm, we're living it every day, but it's still like to hear it and to be sitting here listening to her say this, it's like, wow, it really is the same thing. It's different people, but the same message on both sides, the same message, um, we matter, um, let's have equality, and then the message of, no, you know, what I want is more important than what you need. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can't have it. And we'll use your tax dollars, by the way, to prevent you from having it. You know, we'll use people who are being paid with your money to, to kill you and to, you know, do violence to you. It's mm -hmm. really like unbelievable. Yeah, it is. So, as you mentioned, it was powerful uh, about the fact how we should take from the, the lessons of the past to move forward today. What are you doing um, for, as far as um, the activities to be a change agent? Well, um, being part of Selma, uh, and a couple other things around that time or what really sparked my passion for social justice and me becoming more socially conscious to a lot of the issues that we face um, in America and stuff. So it became a part of me to want to use my art as activism. So have projects that I'm a part of that I create, speak on issues like this or similar that plague people of color so that a dialogue can start because it is really daunting for a lot of people to like, we're gonna sit down and talk about race. Like people's blood pressure starts going up, they start sweating and everything. But if you have a, a TV show or a song or a movie or a book, mm -hmm. it makes the conversation a little bit easier because you're feeling like it's a little bit outside of you. But by watching these things and engaging in these things, you have no choice but to, I, to find yourself in these characters and find yourself in these situations and really self-reflect on what you would be doing in that situation. So through the things that I, the projects that I'm a part of and create, that's my goal. And similar, like you said earlier, my podcast, it launches tomorrow. It's called Get Into It. And we talk about this stuff. I was raised in a predominantly white area and me and me and my friend were, and having these experiences, we were met with racism and race, racial tendencies very early on whether we knew it or not. And you learn to become a voice and an advocate in the spaces that you're around. And so with this podcast, we wanted to have people that are in our situation feel less alone and have an outlet where they can find someone that they can relate to. Because I know that that's something that would have really helped me having, uh, knowing that there are people that are going through the same thing I'm going through whether they are miles away or like next door. I know that would have really helped me. So that's kind of my goal in life to create art for, for people like me. And I also just wanted to add the way you carry yourself is so exceptional. That is also one way to, um, to bring about change with how you, um, the way you conduct yourself, the way you carry yourself, the way you speak. Because oftentimes when they see that, it changes, it goes against the narrative that is shown or in, in media. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing. And I just wanted to compliment you um, with that because that you know, you're using your voice, but also how you carry yourself. It speaks volumes. It speaks in a way that, you know, when you're not talking, um, people can see that. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, bless you. Um, so Jordan, I, I thank you again for dropping these nuggets tonight and being transparent with us and letting us um, relive that journey with you with um, getting the role with, with Selma. And with, um, on behalf of the team, we wish you the best in completing your senior year and hopefully you get to uh, finish the last part of the senior year, not COVID. That's what we're hoping that COVID would be over. 
And um, I just wanted to close off with two more things. The second thing is thank you everyone for just your patience and your um, and, and, and engaging tonight uh, or participating. So we, we, we are happy about it. If you like what you saw tonight, we encourage you to uh, share, share this with your friends as far as the next webinar, which will be a book discussion and you could register using the same link. And that will be on Tuesday, September 22nd. And then the next one after that, it will be in um, October, I believe that's another Tuesday on the 27th. So we'll be having these for sustainability once a month on the second, pardon me, fourth Tuesday of every month from seven to eight. Again, Jordan, we thank you for being with us. And I wanted to end out on one of the nuggets that you said I, that I love so much is what side will I be on? I think that's powerful with anything, whether it's um, dismantling racism or just like with morality, um, with just how we treat people in general. So I hope you all are able to just reflect on that um, or apply that to life. Um, uh, and that's it. You had something, Dr. Bennett? Well, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. What book are we going to discuss next time? Oh, okay. I'm happy you asked. <laughs> that does make sense, doesn't it? It's uh, Unmasking, pardon me, I had it up. Unmasking Racism in Healthcare. Let me see if I could pull it up. And it's by Marie Sinique. And I'll pull the book up so everyone can see it. So I'm just gonna share my screen one more time so everyone could see. So I will say if you order it now, it's gonna take some time because I just ordered it. Oh yeah. So this book is Unmasking Racism in Healthcare Alive and Well, The Greatest Barrier to Reform. Uh, Dr. Bennett, you mentioned that this was a quick read. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's a small book. It's well written. I think it's, um, she gets right to the point. I think it's worth people's time. Okay. I, I give it a thumbs up. Okay, good. So that's the, um, the book that will, we'll, um, the discuss that will lead the discussion. We'll use, pardon me, the guide our discussion on Tuesday, September 22nd from okay. seven to eight. Okay. And, um, does anyone else have any questions before we go? Any questions or comment? Maybe you could comment and let us know if you liked it or if you didn't like it. <laughs> and and what would you like to see next time that will help? You, you can always email us at uh, nursingwithintention at gmail or you could just provide it in the chat. All right, well, we thank you all for- Hey, thank you, Patrice. Okay. I know it. Thank, you. thank you, Jordan. Good thank luck you again. Girl. Good luck. You'll have a great career. Thank you. She will. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.